Welcome to this uh, lecture entitled Imperialism, Europe and the World in the 19th Century. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about um, European imperialism and um, especially Africa and Asia. Uh, you've been asked to read Things Fall Apart by um, Chinua Achebe. And I hope that um, this lecture will give you some context within which to, um, to understand the book and understand a very important period in uh, world history. Um, how is imperialism defined? Uh, well, the, the standard definition is that uh, imperialism is the expansion of European powers and their conquest and colonization of African and Asian societies, mainly from the 16th century through the 19th century. So the period um, that Achebe handles um, is, is the, the mid to late 19th uh, century and uh, European uh, colonization of Africa. Now, um, who was involved in empire building in the 19th century? Quite a few nations. Uh, the primary powers were Britain and France. Um, in Britain, the, the British Empire um, stretched all over the world. Um, you know, Africa, Asia, uh, the same thing with France. Uh, you know, the, the British had really the largest, most impressive empire. The French sort of had a, a large empire, was, you know, in less desirable parts of the world. Uh, Germany uh, was becoming a major imperial power in the 1880s and 1890s. And the same with Japan and the United States, who uh, remained regional powers. You know, the United States primarily um, uh, had influence over the Caribbean and Central America, you know, places in the Caribbean like Puerto Rico and Cuba and uh, later the Dominican Republic and Haiti and in Central America, places like Nicaragua where we actually had troops stationed for a long time. We had troops uh, stationed in Haiti as well in the 1920s and 1930s. And in places like Panama, where we built uh, uh, the Panama Canal, which links the Caribbean with the Pacific. So the United States' sphere of influence has always been um, really limited to the Caribbean and Central America. And uh, beyond that, uh, the Philippines was uh, the area outside of the Caribbean that the United States had um, military bases for a long time. And um, the Japanese had carved out an empire in Asia, which included pieces of China and Southeast Asia, etc., um, starting from uh, you know eight, the 1890s on. And the Japanese had become so powerful in Asia that by 1941, you know, they were at war with the United States. Okay, uh, why did Western politicians engage in empire building? Um, if we take a look at the British and the French. You know, their reasons for empire building were many. Um, historians believe that the biggest reason why imperialism happened, why these countries began to uh, build empires, was really to deflect social problems at home uh, through nationalism. Now, why were there social problems at home? Well, uh, a lot of it had to do with the Industrial Revolution that was happening in the 19th century right across uh, Europe. And uh, what we really had happening was a lot of tension between this new working class and the factories and uh, the bosses and uh, you know, the economic elites in these places. And what, you know, these problems are very intense. You know, the, the animosity between, you know, uh, people making six cents an hour and people making, you know, uh, $100,000 a year or whatever uh, was, was, was very sharp. And... Um, you could actually distract people from their from their problems, from their economic and social woes, by getting them to focus on the empire or um, places far away. So deflecting social problems was very uh, much on the minds of politicians, and nationalism was a very very powerful component of uh, European um, society in the 19th century. The idea that you belong to um, a superior nation better than others and you have um, 
you know, the best empire in the world and the strongest military. And uh, we can see politicians today use that same kind of strategy. Uh, in 2003, when the economy was doing poorly, uh, the war in Iraq started and all the bad economic news went to the back page and all the patriotic, nationalistic uh, fervor, you know, went to the, went right to the, um, went, to, went to the, you know, page one. Uh, secondly, imperialism was um, was uh, important, you know, for um, Western politicians because it provided working class uh, and bourgeois classes. By bourgeois, I mean middle class with employment opportunities. Um, if you were a working class person and you wanted a man, particularly, and you wanted to get away from uh, that slum you were living in or that dead end job in a factory where you're working a lot of hours for low pay. You know, the uh, you could join the army or the navy, and you could spend, you know, uh, time traveling the world on the government's dime, and you'd be guaranteed uh, uh, three square meals a day in a clean uniform, and uh, if you spent enough time in the service, then maybe a small pension. So uh, it was very attractive, you know, outlet for the working class, and uh, for the bourgeoisie, it allowed um, middle class educated people a chance to work in the foreign service or uh, to work as diplomats, uh, th you know, things of that nature. And uh, finally, there was a need in Europe in the 19th century to spread, uh, quote, superior European culture to, quote, less civilized places in the world. Um, there is a real sense in Europe that um, they, because of their industri industry, because of the power of their empires and their economic wealth and military might, that they possessed a superior uh, Christian culture that uh, was much better than any other, quote, less civilized culture in Asia and Africa. So there is what, this is what historians call cult cultural imperialism, the idea that you're going to spread your culture, your Christianity, you're going to spread um, your values, you know, your values of materialism and economic progress, etc., to other parts of the world. And this is what some historians believe is the negative kind of um, uh, negative sort of side of the Enlightenment, you know, the European Enlightenment, that you can enlighten other people of the world with your values. And it is a very, very touchy thing, and we see it in Things Fall Apart, too. Uh, the idea that you're going to spread to these poor Africans your, you know, your religion and your your values because, you know, they're, they're, um, they're less civilized than you. Now, if we look at um, the British Empire, uh, there was a famous quote that um, people often uh, spoke of in the 19th century, the sun never sets on the British Empire. And this means that, you know, the British Empire spread from, you know, Hong Kong, uh, you know, and through China to, to India, to, um, you know, parts of uh, uh, the Caribbean, Places like Jamaica, Canada, places where they had a lot of influence if we're, you know, they were not outright colonizing. So it really gave the British a real um, advantage, you know, in terms of uh, you know their naval supremacy and also the ability of their merchants to travel the world and refuel and uh, carry on trade. You know, if you have bases all over the world, military bases, naval bases, it gives you a lot of power. Uh, so the British Empire was envied by the French and the Germans who tried to emulate uh, the empire. The French had Southeast Asia, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos were part of, uh, you know, the British, I'm sorry, the French Empire, rather, and the French were getting rubber, tin, things of that nature, you know, those resources from um, Southeast Asia, rice, other stuff like that as well. And... Um, the French also had parts of uh, Africa that weren't the most, you know, um, rich in terms of natural resources like Algeria, you know, North Africa, you know, um, Algeria, Tunisia, places like that, Morocco. Um, the Germans had uh, East Africa, you know, um, and, and little small kind of outposts in Africa, nothing really uh, impressive by imperialist standards to speak of. 
Uh, the crown jewel of the British Empire was India. The British used Indian cotton for their factories, and India was a useful fueling station for ships. So India was really the center of the British Empire until 1948, when um, a peace movement led by, uh, by Gandhi um, helped to uh, essentially force the Brits, uh, the British, to uh, retreat and uh, leave India to its independence. So very, very... Um, you know, important was um, was India. Now, the rush for colonies uh, was a major problem uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries, and by 1914, it was uh, really a major reason for World War One. Uh, that cannot be denied. That uh, the international tension caused by all of these European nations, um, you know, the, the 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 Americans and the Japanese are really regional powers. They're not really world powers yet, but the, the Europeans are still very much in the driver's seat in terms of international politics. And by 1914, um, it's going to be one of the reasons why these nations uh, go to war, really fighting over both the honor of having an empire and also the resources that these empires provide. Uh, so uh, that wraps up um, this, this short lecture. And um, you will need to understand the lecture for the midterm and also hopefully it will give you some context for things fall apart.